I call on the Honourable Hekia Parata to make her valedictory statement. Tera te haia ta takiri ana mai i runga o hikurangi. Ara whaiuru, whaiuru, whaiuru. Ara whaiato, whaiato, whaiato. Ara ratini, ara ratini, ara ri. E te mana whakawā. Tēnei au te tahi o ngā uri a ngā koro tīpuna, a paraurangi rāu ko tōna taina, a tahu pōtiki, me te kōka tīpuna, a hamoterangi e mihi nei. Tēnā koutou, tātou e whakawhaiti hi a tātou, a kuni ka hiki te whare pāremata mō tēnei tau toru. Tēnā koe e te mana whakawā, koutou ko o kai āwhina, kai mahi hoki e whakahaere nei tēnei whare rangatira, tēnei matatini o ngā rohe katoa o Aotearoa whānui. Kei te mana whenua, te ati awa, ngā mihi kia koutou, ngā kaitiaki o tēnei wāhi, e manāki nei i a mātou, e whakamahia ngā tikanga mō ngā iwi katoa, e harama koutou anake, tēnā koutou. Kei ngā iwi katoa o Aotearoa, iwi taketake, iwi tiriti, ngā hau e whā, tēnā, nau mai, Piki mai ki roto ki tēnei whare tōhau te marae o ngā tangata katoa, te marae mō ngā tangata katoa. Hara mai, hoki mai, hara mai. Me poroporo aki tātou ki a rātou kua mene atu ki te pō, kua hipatu i te tatau, a hene nui te pō. Haere koutou haere. Ko parekura tēnā, takutu ngāne, moe mai rā. Hoki mai ki a tātou, ngā waihotanga iho o rātou mā, ngā kanohi ora, huri noa i tō tātou whare, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Mr Speaker, today is a day of thanks. My performance as a Member of Parliament and as a Minister is a matter of public record and for others to judge. I am leaving with a great sense of gratitude for the immense privilege it has been to serve in this way, in this time, my fellow New Zealanders and our country. Mr Speaker, I am leaving satisfied with what I have been able to contribute, proud of a number of achievements, stronger and more resilient than I ever imagined I would have to be. I am leaving with a huge optimism for our future and the settled conviction that I was blessed to have been born to these Pacific Isles, a New Zealander. Well, a Ngāti Parau woman New Zealander, to be absolutely accurate. I guess I was just lucky. We all of us are the sons and daughters, descendants of adventurers, navigators, visionaries, risk takers, brave and tenacious people with imagination, grit and hope who crossed Te Mōna Nui Ākiwa, whether by whale, waka, ship or plane, to make this place, Aotearoa New Zealand, their home. Ours is a small, smart, sassy nation, and all of us have a responsibility to our forebears and to those who come after us to make it even better. And I have enjoyed the great gift of being a part of this House of Representatives and our government as we have taken up that responsibility. Mr Speaker, we have served nine years as a national-led coalition government to build a better New Zealand than we found it. And we have done that in many practical, significant and measurable ways. And all of those will be examined and judged over the coming weeks. And I trust that New Zealanders will value the unique blend of stability and competence, fresh ideas, and the detail and experience to execute them that our team offers. I leave knowing that my place and those of my colleagues who are also leaving are filled by capable, energetic, thoughtful people. We must constantly refresh if we are to stay relevant to New Zealand families, and I am proud that our caucus and new candidates reflect that challenge. And as our coalition separates for the battle ahead, I want to acknowledge our partners, 
United Future, ACT, and Te Pāti Māori. And to thank them for the support they have given me in the policy and legislative initiatives I have pursued. Ngā mihi. To my parliamentary colleagues, thank you for being a part of the active democracy that New Zealand is and must always be, for your commitment to making this the best country that it can possibly be. Tēnā koutou. Mr Speaker, I found it extremely difficult preparing for this valedictory statement. It is a challenge to distill to a handful of memories, all the memories, to ensure all those who should be mentioned are, and that Hansard records a fitting end to my time here. The expectations feel very high. It reminds me of a time I was standing in the wings of the year 7 to 13, that would be Form 1 to Form 7, Leadership Conference in Taranaki. And I asked my 11-year-old introducer what he thought I should say. He looked up at me, hopefully, and asked, can you be funny? <laughs> in a nanosecond, I could see he'd written that possibility off and trudged onto the stage with me following in his wake just so you know. Mr Speaker, I'm proud to be a member of the National Party, to have served in a national-led government, and to make policy based on values of equal citizenship and equal opportunity, of individual freedom and choice, personal accountability and responsibility, competitive enterprise and rewards for achievement, and limited government. And the challenge to create the conditions in our economy and our society so New Zealanders of whatever background have the opportunity to realise their potential. That's the essence of rangatiratanga, the kind I'm interested in, the personal, practical, everyday kind, where New Zealanders are self-determining, in charge of their own lives, able to make choices and to live independent of the government. I've always said I'll leave the tinnel variety to iwi. Mr Speaker, in my maiden speech almost nine years ago, I said that I wanted to contribute to developing quality citizenship for all New Zealanders, and a defining aspect of that would be the reduction of dependence on the state. I've been part of a government that has, in response, focused on a strong and growing economy, the creation of new jobs, raising the level of qualifications and skills, finding new trade opportunities, investing in infrastructure, science and innovation. None of that on its own sounds that sexy or exciting. But unless we have those, we don't have the ingredients for the recipe of a sustainably better life. Mr Speaker, the other side of that is the social wellbeing and welfare of people. That's what our social investment approach, led by the Prime Minister, is about. To achieve equality of citizenship, there must be unequal resource and support for those most vulnerable, those least able to help themselves. We know better than ever who we need to help and how we marshal the resources of the government to do that. In turn, we have seen a reduction in benefit dependence. But Mr Speaker, the binary nature of politics is that, is that if you haven't done absolutely everything, you're accused of not having done anything. Not true. We have done much, and there is much more to do. But in doing so, we have to keep in mind the hard work of New Zealanders represented in their taxes and savings. Mr Speaker, I know that when promises are made to spend more, it's not the government's money, as so many assert, it's the teachers and nurses and policemen, the builders, the plumbers, the electricians, the businesses, small and big. It's my whānau planting seedlings on eroding hillsides in drenching rain, or collecting hives in blistering heat, or fixing potholes and slips and drains as logging trucks drivers loop tediously along State Highway 35. That's whose money it is not the government's. That's who we have to account to. And I have never lost sight of that as we've sought to make the best decisions with their money. 
Mr Speaker, in my maiden speech, I also said that I wanted to, quote, join the crusade for literacy and numeracy and for a good quality education for every New Zealand student. I said that we must adopt an uncompromising attitude that failure is not an option. All our other aspirations for economic growth, raised standards of living, and national confidence and pride will flow from getting these basics right. And of course, I had the tremendous opportunity as Minister of Education to carry out my six-year crusade. Mr Speaker, I came from a modest background. We did not own the home we grew up in. We never owned a car all the time we were growing up. With the change in our family circumstances, we were so grateful for a state house and my mother for the DPB, as it was then known. We worked before and after school jobs to support our family. And through it all, we knew that getting a good education was the answer to a better life. Every opportunity I have had has arisen out of having that education and hard work. And that is why I have been so focused on rewiring our education system to make sure that every one of our young people gets the opportunity of the best education possible. But Mr Speaker, before that, I held portfolios or associate responsibilities for women, ethnic affairs, energy and resources, community and the voluntary sector, and ACC. I learned something from all of these, but energy and resources was the portfolio I learned the most in, understanding what a rich set of resources we have around and in our country. It's also the portfolio which got me pretty much excommunicated from my tuakana iwi, Te Whanua Apanui, for proceeding with the approval for exploration for oil and gas in the Raukumara Basin. Somewhat awkward, <laughs> given we have a home there, and we would have to drive past garages and fences, saying bilingually, just what an egg I was. <laughs> Mr Speaker, it was also during my stewardship that the Maui gas pipeline went down taking with it all the hot water in hotels and motels from Topo North, turning off milking sheds, factories and businesses across the same vast area. I learnt there was a protocol for the priority of who got reconnected first as the line became restored, and I was lobbied and lobbied. But in that process, I learnt that Sanitarium, Chelsea and Fonterra with a necessary trifecta for half the country to get a good start to the day. <laughs> and of course, Orion Energy making sure that they could restore power safely and methodically across Christchurch. Mr Speaker, one of the privileges one has as a minister is to meet outstanding New Zealanders and to see the skills and knowledge ingenuity and good humour they bring to their everyday work, and most particularly in a crisis. And then I got education. Mr Speaker, my dream job, the reason I ran for Parliament. When the then Prime Minister rang to tell me, I practically perforated his eardrum. I was so excited. Apparently, that hasn't often been the response to being offered the education <laughs> portfolio. In addition, I was given the Pacific Island Affairs portfolio, and what an honour that was. Back when I was training to be a diplomat in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I know when people think of me, the first word that springs to mind is diplomatic. <laughs> Back then in the 1980s, I was arguing for a more Pacific-centred policy, for New Zealand to see itself as part of the Pacific, not just on the other side of it. I loved my time in the portfolio, meeting Pacific people who were working so hard, committed to their children doing well, singing in church the way we did growing up, and producing some of the best sportsmen and women, and increasingly excelling across the health sector in particular. I also learned this, together with the ethnic affairs portfolio, how real and alive the diverse cultures are that make up our communities and the richness this adds to all our lives. I think they also have more and longer hui than the Maori people do. <laughs> 
just saying. Mr Speaker, I want to thank our former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Sir John Key, for his leadership. He brought a clinical set of decision-making tools to the job, together with a wholehearted embrace of this country, a confidence about our place in the world, and an unshakable optimism about what was possible. As a boss, he appointed you to a role, gave you general guidance, and trusted you to get on with it. That was at times both scary and exhilarating, probably for him as well as me. I want to record my thanks for his unflagging support. It was the PM in 2013 who encouraged me to look at something big for education. Of course, it was then the Minister of Finance, the Right Honourable Prime Minister today, who had to be persuaded to fund it. And that, folks, is how we got what I think will truly be transformational for our education system. Communities of learning, or kahuiako, that keep everything that is special and different about individual schools and centres, but systematically joins them in a collaboration centred on the child and their 18-year learning pathway. Mr Speaker, it cost a shipload of money, $359 million, the biggest single social investment initiative we had made as a government. It puts the emphasis on the student and their learning and achievement, and it creates 6,000 new roles for teachers and leaders. I want to put on record here my appreciation of the leadership role that the PPTA took with this initiative. To be clear, peace did not then break out. We did continue to argue and disagree about other things. I also want to thank the many teachers and education leaders who have not only embraced this opportunity, but who every day bring care and commitment, capability and competence, fun and innovation to the children and young people in their centres and classrooms. We have some of the best educators and education practice in the world, and we see the value in that in the rising achievement of our young people. Mr Speaker, we have about 2,500 schools and over 5,000 early learning centres and just under a million young New Zealanders engaged in learning. And my relentless expectation as Minister of Education was that every child in every classroom every day was learning and achieving. I appropriated from a speech I heard from the then Chief Review Officer, Dr Graham Stoop, a line that said, quote, the core business of a school is to cause learning to happen and to know that it did. As simple and as complicated as that. We have an education system with an architecture that is one of the best in the world. But like my generation and smartphones, we use only a small amount of its potential. I saw my job as rewiring the system and leveraging that architecture to make sure that it serves every Kiwi kid, to push those who are doing well to do even better, and to pick up those that the system had been leaving behind. I'm glad to say that we now have the data to know that all population groups have lifted, and in particular at senior secondary, Māori and Pacifica students are achieving at almost twice the rate from when we came into government in 2008. Mr Speaker, that's real kids with real results, able to make real choices about what next for them. That's great for them and that's great for our country. Mr Speaker, I had the privilege as Minister of Education to visit centres and schools up and down the country and to see the magic that so many of them create. Little Ōturu School in the far north developing natural cures for cellulitis and then selling them. Sylvia Park Primary School involving its whole community in art and sculpture and the living environment. A primary school in Mangere East lifting numer uh, numeracy through Bobby Maths, a culturally based team approach. Te kura o ngā tapuwai, turning out kiorahi exponents and top scholars. Tarawera College in Kawero. Tamatea High in Flaxmere, Pātea College in Taranaki, achieving phenomenal results due to high quality leadership. 
Tolaga Bay Area School, leading a whole of community inquiry based on the transit of Venus and an ongoing ecological project partnering with iwi and the wider community. Kaiti Primary School leading the way in teaching excellence, a little Nelson Lake School introducing ethics-based studies to six, seven and eight-year-olds, 23 Marlborough schools forming a community of learning, and Hyatta Community Campus formed from four schools in Christchurch East, leading a revolution in learning and lifting the community as it does so. I have this brilliant idea, are there any other kinds, that I offer to the universe today. Develop a weekly broadcast program modelled on country calendar, showing a different school, kura, kahuyako, and see the stories unfold and the difference they are making. Magic. Mr Speaker, this is the fourth year that the Prime Minister's Education Excellence Awards have been held. It is a way of showcasing and celebrating the best practice in our education system, and I hope part of the way of changing the public conversation about education to a far more positive one. This is the second year of the Education Council dedicated to growing and lifting the teaching profession. But a word of caution, Mr Speaker. No matter how much we invest to grow and develop the profession, they simply cannot and should not be expected to take up every latest demand. As I said earlier, the core business of schools is to cause learning to happen. It is not the job of schools to become the default for everything young pe people should learn. As Minister, I was lobbied to have schools become social welfare hubs, health hubs, provide financial literacy, sex education, and so on. Different schools can and do make decisions about how and what they operate. But Mr Speaker, Schools are not our mothers and fathers. They are not our families or whānau. They cannot be everything to everybody, and nor should they. Theirs is already a huge responsibility to educate our kids. Mr Speaker, I want to table for the House today my calling card for this past term of government. Just sitting there, right. It sets out the system changes that are underway helpfully on the back are references to the relevant key papers. It provides a short summary, Mr Speaker, and saves the House a fuller recitation. <laughs> but a small, small and colourful as this postcard is, it represents a lot of work by a lot of people. Mr Speaker, I said that today was a day for thanks. I think we have a magnificent public service. I think it is the best in the world. It is probably one of the smallest, but certainly one that delivers above and beyond. Ahakua iti he bonamu. Although small, it is of the quality of Greenstone. Thanks to all those public servants who supported the work of my portfolios. Mr Speaker, the education portfolio is not the most popular, which I can testify to, but it is incredibly rewarding. And the work we did together has been some of the most satisfying of my professional life. I want to thank Peter Hughes, both for his leadership of the Ministry of Education and the education sector in government, and for his full support of me and my work program. He tells me with sincerity and good humour that he loved it, although not always in the moment. <laughs> thank you, Peter. I want to thank Iona Holstead, first in her role as Chief Review Officer of Aero, where she asked me what I was looking for, and then with intelligence and conviction, she over-delivered. Such a woman thing. And then, as Secretary for Education, she has gotten stuck in bringing all her social policy background and grit to bear. I want to thank Karen Patasi, heading the New Zealand Qualifications Authority. And don't worry, I'm not going to go through every principal in the country as well. And her board, in particular for the strategic vision they have been working toward. Take notice, assessment online, anyone, anytime. In a truly student-centred education system, the choice of what and when a student gets assessed will have profound changes, not least of which the manacle of timetabling that serves adults more than the students. I just want to segue quickly to illustrate the powerfully different 
powerful difference the multiple vocational pathway choices young people have in our system today under this government, and how much more engaging this is for so many of them. I was visiting the Build a Batch project in New Plymouth and talking to students working on it. I asked one young guy what was the key education thing he had learnt building the batch. He said, I know why I have to be able to read now. And pointing to a stack of cans, he said, because that shit's flammable, miss. That means it burns. <laughs> but we need flexibility and timetabling to make more of this happen more easily for our students. Mr Speaker, Peter, Iona and Karen have been served by a leadership team of deputy secretaries, some of whom have gone on to serve elsewhere, who I am proud to have worked with. Every one of them unstintingly worked to meet really high expectations, and I want to thank them all and their teams. I trust I will be forgiven for naming just two people for special reasons, but who exemplify the commitment that all have shown. I want to acknowledge Katrina Casey and Coralanne Child, and their leadership in the Greater Christchurch Selwyn and Waimakariri Education Network over the past five years. Both had family or homes also affected by the earthquakes and both led staff similarly affected. Day in and day out, at night and on too many weekends, they worked to restore, repair, redevelop, support and sustain the people and the education system there as many other public servants did also. They accompanied me when I met with every community at least once, many multiple times, to explain, to listen, to apologise, to deliver. Mr Speaker, I completely accept that we got some things wrong. But there wasn't a manual for those circumstances. We didn't have five years to think about it. We did the best we could. Thank you both and all those who worked with you. I know that we are about halfway through the billion dollar program to repair and rebuild and build new 115 schools. And already the network is fulfilling its promise in the continued growth in learning and achievement. Mr Speaker, I want to thank the ministry folk who staffed my office over the years and the advisers in my office who have organised me, prepped me, planned for me and around me, who repaid the high trust I placed in them many times over. Thank you for looking out for me and after me. Karadaina Crib, Ōtene Farero, Hiria Parata, Julie Ash, Florence Falmuina, Charlotte Haycock, Tupe Solomon Tanoai, Anna Barbono, Nick Venter, Jasmine Higginson and Bridget Morton, with a special thanks for keeping me up on pop culture, trending Netflix series, fashion, latest diets and Wellington on a plate. Thanks too to Jeff Short and Matt Sanders for their fountain of knowledge, incredible networks and good advice. I quickly turn to the National Party. I want to acknowledge former President Michelle Bogue, who first recruited me in 2001 and has been a steadfast supporter of mine ever since. Patricia Morrison, who inducted me into the ways of the party and could not have been a better mentor. To Peter Goodfellow and the board, our regional chairs, those who are sitting behind me, which seems appropriate now because I have always felt the National Party behind me, Electorate Committee's members and volunteers who are the backbone of our party, thank you all. Mr Speaker, I have cause to be particularly grateful to those who have voted national, because they have put me in Parliament these past three terms of government as a list member. Mr Speaker, despite early mornings on Police Hill beside State Highway 1, hammering up hoardings, leafleting letterboxes and generally throwing myself at the Mana electorate, I have not been able to uncouple it, first from Lua Manuval Winnie Laban and now Chris Farfoy, both thoroughly lovely people with a peculiar political penchant. <laughs> we, we have, however, won the party vote twice and are working very hard to keep that arrangement this September. And it is here I pay particular thanks to the Munner electorate team, a number of you in the galleries today, and you have my thanks for your support. My special thanks go to my dear friend and her whanau, who since we set out on this waka have been with me and mine all the way. Panya Tyson Nathan, you are amazing. Whatever I've needed, whenever I've needed it, you have been there. Evan Nathan, for your long suffering support and assistance. <laughs> Enoka Mare Kura, who press scanned into my campaigns, became the handiest thing on a nail gun and the smoothest mover in human hoardings, to now being the father of a gorgeous wee girl. And Caleb 
who has practically grown up in the National Party, featuring in our pamphlets and singing for many of our suppers. We've had fun and challenging times, but we've been dedicated and focused. I remember once when teams of us were out leafleting, I got a call from Enoka saying, Mum's been bitten by a dog and we're going to A&E. I raced over to Kenipuru to see how she was. It was pretty bad. She'd been stitched and had multiple shots and was on pain medication. Once I'd established, however, that she had been sorted, I was able to ask, um, did you manage to finish that street? <laughs> Sorry, pardon. <laughs> to the three dames and two sirs who in different ways and at different times have offered me wisdom, encouragement, poetry, prayer, and love. Thank you, Dame Iritana Tafifirangi, Dame Jenny Shipley, Dame Karen Saul, and Sir Brother Patrick Lynch. The other sir I'll come back to. Mr. Speaker, an excerpt from the poem from Landfall in Unknown Seas by Alan Kurno became a touchstone for me. Quote, simply by sailing in a new direction, you could enlarge the world. Thank you, Karen. Mr. Speaker, we have a brilliant caucus with an extremely able cabinet led by a good man. To the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Bill English, it has been a real honour to work with and for you, to debate policy with you, some might say argue vociferously, to be prepped and on my mettle, ready to make a budget case when you were Finance Minister. Thank you. I wish you every success in this election, because apart from every other qualification you have for the job, you are the only Prime Minister who can share a sheep. And where I come from, that counts. <laughs> to our Deputy Prime Minister, Paula Bennett, te nākwe. You are a fierce and feisty warrior woman whose hard work, strength and sense of fun have been a model to us all. I salute you and your mana wahine. Together, I think your leadership is awesome. To the 2008ers, all 16 of us, it's been a blast. I couldn't have wished for a more diverse, smart, talented bunch of people to come into Parliament with. Mr Speaker, to you and your colleagues and all the people who make this place tick, my thanks. It is a veritable ecosystem that keeps the machinery going to ensure we have the active democracy we do. A special shout out to the VIP drivers who we often spend more time with than our families. Thank you. To the press gallery, my apologies. I just could not shake the conviction that if I just explained why, you would all say, oh, now we get it. Okay, we won't report it the way we were going to. And sorry uh, to all my press secretaries, I just couldn't get the neck of the sound bite either. Self-evidently. Okay, to my family. What a roller coaster ride we've had. Thanks to all my brothers and sisters and partners for always, always being there. To my two sisters, fabulous educators themselves, who have stood silently behind me and proudly for me. April and Nori, thank you. To my nieces and nephews, apart from being great campaign volunteers, thank you for your wraparound love of your two cousins. To Wira, my pragmatic, phlegmatic soldier protector. Thanks for looking after our girls. Thanks for tweeting right back at them. Thanks for this decade doing this stuff. And to our daughters, Rākei Te Mania and Mihi Maraia, who have grown up in this funny kind of life that is politics, you make me so proud. In this time, you've gone from early primary school to completing university or within one semester of, from young girls to gorgeous young women. It hasn't been easy as everyone in this house knows more than anyone to have a parent in politics. But you have understood the call to public service and you have been unflinching in your love and support of me. I came here wanting to make a difference for our country and for a better future. 
I know you have understood that and been proud of me and my work, but I also know how glad you are that I am making this valedictory statement today. I love you always and forever. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the mums and dads, nannies and papas, the families Fano and Ainga who care passionately about the well-being and education of their children and young people, and who wrote to me, met with me, attended education events, who give up their time to coach, to support their schools, to be on the board, to encourage art and drama productions. Thank you all. Our children's education is better for it. Mr Speaker, I'm speaking almost from where I started in this house, a full circle. I have loved my time here. I am humbled to have had the opportunity and honoured to be a participant in making our country better. And so to those who gave me advice, told me where to go and how quickly I could get there, <laughs> I'm on my way. Hoia nora, ka pū te ruha, ka hau te rangatahi. Ngā manaakitanga kia koutou katoa, kia ora tātou. Honourable Members, the House is suspended for the dinner break. I will resume the chair at 7.30 p.m. <laughs> <laughs>